Simmons's infamous behavior toward his wife is still matter for profound wonderment among the neighbors. The other women had all along regarded him as a model husband, and certainly Mrs. Simmons was a most conscientious wife. She toiled and slaved for that man, as any woman in the whole street would have maintained, far more than any husband had a right to expect. And now this was what she got for it. Perhaps he had suddenly gone mad. Before she married Simmons, Mrs. Simmons had been the widowed Mrs. Ford. Ford had got a berth as donkey man on a trap steamer, and that steamer had gone down with all hands off the Cape. A judgment, the widow woman feared, for long years of contumacy, which had culminated in the wickedness of taking to the sea and taking to it as a donkey man an immeasurable fall for a capable engine fitter. Twelve years as Mrs. Ford had left her still childless, and childless she remained as Mrs. Simmons. As for Simmons, he, it was held, was fortunate in that capable wife. He was a moderately good carpenter and joiner, but no man of the world, and he wanted one. Nobody could tell what might not have happened to Tommy Simmons if there had been no Mrs. Simmons to take care of him. He was a meek and quiet man, with a boyish face and sparse, limp whiskers. He had no vices, even his pipe departed him after his marriage, and Mrs. Simmons had engrafted on him diverse exotic virtues. He went solemnly to chapel every Sunday, under a tall hat, and put a penny, one returned to him for the purpose, out of his week's wages, in the plate. Then Mrs. Simmons, overseeing, he took off his best clothes and brushed them with solicitude and pains. On Saturday afternoons he cleaned the knives, the forks, the boots, the kettles, and the windows, patiently and conscientiously. On Tuesday evenings he took the clothes to the mangling. And on Saturday nights he attended Mrs. Simmons in her marketing to carry the parcels. Mrs. Simmons's own virtues were native and numerous. She was a wonderful manager. Every penny of Tommy's thirty-six or thirty-eight shillings a week was bestowed to the greatest advantage, and Tommy never ventured to guess how much of it she saved. Her cleanliness in housewifery was distracting to behold. She met Simmons at the front door whenever he came home, and then and there he changed his boots for slippers, balancing himself painfully on alternate feet on the cold flags. This was because she scrubbed the passage and doorstep, turned about, with the wife of the downstairs family, and because the stair carpet was her own. She vigilantly supervised her husband all through the process of cleaning himself after work, so as to come between her walls and the possibility of random splashes. And if, in spite of her diligence, a spot remained to tell the tale, she was at pains to impress the fact on Simmons's memory, and to set forth at length all the circumstances of his ungrateful selfishness. In the beginning she had always escorted him to the ready-made clothes shop, and had selected and paid for his clothes, for the reason that men are such perfect fools, and shopkeepers do as they like with them. But she presently improved on that. She found a man selling cheap remnants at a street corner, and straightway she conceived the idea of making Simmons's clothes herself. Decision was one of her virtues and a suit of uproarious check tweeds was begun that afternoon from the pattern furnished by an old one. More, it was finished by Sunday, 
when Simmons, overcome by astonishment at the feat, was endued in it, and pushed off to chapel ere he could recover his senses. The things were not altogether comfortable, he found. The trousers hung tight against his shins, but hung loose behind his heels. And when he sat, it was on a wilderness of hard folds and seams. Also his waistcoat collar tickled his nape, but his coat collar went straining across from shoulder to shoulder, while the main garment bagged generously below his waist. Use made a habit of his discomfort, but it never reconciled him to the chaff of his shopmates. For as Mrs. Simmons elaborated successive suits, each one modeled on the last, the primal accidents of her design developed into principles, and grew even bolder and more hideously pronounced. It was vain for Simmons to hint, as hint he did, that he shouldn't like her to overwork herself, tailoring being bad for the eyes, and there was a new tailor's in the Mile End Road, very cheap, where, oh, yes, she retorted, you're very considerate, I dare say, sitting there, acting a living lie before your own wife, Thomas Simmons, as though I couldn't see through you like a book. A lot you care about your overworking me, as long as your turn's served, throwing away money like dirt in the street on a lot of swindling tailors, and me working and slaving here to keep a penny. And this is my return for it. Anyone would think you could pick up money in the horse road, and I believe I'd be thought better of if I laid in bed all day like some would that I do. So that Thomas Simmons avoided the subject, nor even murmured when she resolved to cut his hair. So his placid fortune endured for years. Then there came a golden summer evening when Mrs. Simmons betook herself with a basket to do some small shopping, and Simmons was left at home. He washed and put away the tea things, and then fell to meditating on a new pair of trousers, finished that day, and hanging behind the parlor door. There they hung, in all their decent innocence of shape in the seat, and they were shorter of leg, longer of waist, and wilder of pattern than he had ever worn before. And as he looked on them, the small devil of original sin awoke and clamored in his breast. He was ashamed of it, of course, for well he knew the gratitude he owed his wife for those same trousers, among other blessings. She, she don't like smoke in an ear, said Simmons, as it were, at random. No, I bet she don't, Ford answered, taking his pipe from his mouth and holding it low in his hand. I know Anner. Well, Simmons admitted uneasily, I, I do help her sometimes, of course. Ah, and the knives, too, I bet, and the bloomin' kittles. I know. Why, he rose and bent to look behind Simmons's head. Selp me, I believe she cuts your hair. Well, I'm damned. Just what she would do, too. He inspected the blushing Simmons from diverse points of vantage. Then he lifted a leg of the trousers hanging behind the door. I bet a trifle, he said, she made these ear trucks. Nobody else would do em like that. Demi, they're worse'n what you've got on. The small devil began to have the argument all its own way. If this man took his wife back, perhaps he'd have to wear those trousers. Ah, Ford pursued, she ain't got no milder. Simmons began to feel that this was no longer his business. Plainly, Anner was this other man's wife, and he was bound in honor to acknowledge the fact. The small devil put it into him as a matter of duty. Well, said Ford suddenly, time's short and this ain't business. 
I won't be hard on you, matey. I ought properly to stand on my rights, but seeing as you're a well-meaning young man, so, so to speak, and all settled and living here quiet and matrimonial, I'll, this with a burst of generosity, damn me, yes, I'll compound the felony and take me ook. Come, I'll name a figure, as man to man, fust and last, no less and no more. Five pounds does it. Simmons hadn't five pounds. He hadn't even five pence. And he said so. And I wouldn't think a coming between a man and his wife, he added, not on no account. It may be rough on me, but it's a duty. I'll look it. No, said Ford hastily, clutching Simmons by the arm. Don't do that. I'll make it a bit cheaper. I apologize. You stop and have your proper rights. It's me as ought to shunt, and I will. And he made a step toward the door. Hold on, quoth Ford, and got between Simmons and the door. Don't do things rash. Look what a loss it'll be to you, with no home to go to, nobody to look after ye, and all that. I'll see, said Thomas Simmons, in reply, and he made a rush for the staircase. Bob Ford heard him open the front door. Then he went to the window, and just below him he saw the crown of a bonnet. It vanished, and, borne to him from within the door, there fell upon his ear the sound of a well-remembered female voice. "'Where are you going now, with no at? asked the voice sharply. "'All right, Anna, there's, there's somebody upstairs to see you,' Simmons answered. And, as Bob Ford could see, a man went scuttling down the street in the gathering dusk. And, behold, it was Thomas Simmons. Ford reached the landing in three strides. His wife was still at the front door, staring after Simmons. He flung into the back room, threw open the window, dropped from the wash-house roof into the back yard, scrambled desperately over the fence, and disappeared into the gloom. He was seen by no living soul. And that is why Simmons's base desertion, under his wife's very eyes, too, is still an astonishment to the neighbors. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.